everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have so many people on the line. As many of you know, this webinar is sold out. We are going to be recording this because we've had such demand. We'll make it shortly available on the OPPI website and on our YouTube channel. In terms of the agenda, we've shaken things up a little bit. We're going to combine more of the call to action directly into the presentation because Call to action is all about the public realm, so we'll get things underway in a minute. My name is Loretta Ryan. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Ontario Professional Planners Institute, and I am a registered professional planner. With me today is Rob Voigt, who's also an RPP, and he is Chair of the Planning Issues Strategy Group, better known as the PISG. We also have with us Eldon Theodore, RPP, who is Chair of the PISG's Community Design Working Group and I'm thrilled to have both of them here today. As we are recording the webinar, and to ensure quality of the sound, we have muted the lines. If you have a question for us, please use the chat function to ask. We'll also have a chance at the end of the presentation to address any questions. If you experience any technical difficulty during the meeting, please don't hesitate to call our technical support at 1-855-658 2584 and ask for C meeting support. I'll now turn the presentation over to Rob. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think by the fact that we have, uh, as Loretta mentioned, a, a sold out uh, crowd, if you will, uh, online, that um, there is great interest in this subject matter. Um, it is something that is becoming increasingly important, uh, not only to the uh, planning profession, but also uh, we see from those people that we serve, which is the public. The interest in the public realm, or the commons, um, is increasing because of its great impact on our lives. So what is the public realm? Well, as we've uh, given you a, a wonderful definition in our call to action, which we'll be referring to a little later as well, the public realm is defined as the publicly owned places and spaces that belong to and are accessible by everyone. So really, what does that mean? Well, it's, think of it this way. It's maybe all those places between the buildings. It's the passive environment, such as where you might be sitting at a cafe, or an active environment, such as a cycling on a bike lane, or maybe a combination of both. Quite often, we only think of the public realm as those places that are, um, are active, such as park spaces where you might be going to uh, play soccer, um, or uh, um, a ball diamond or things of that nature. But we need to remember that our streets are also part of the public realm. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how we can reimagine those areas that are under public ownership for um, increased benefit to the community. We also need to think about the interior spaces, such as libraries or recreation centers. So again, those are civic buildings that have a purpose beyond just their, their obvious function and are part of the overall public realm network. So these are all things that we need to consider in terms of what is the public realm. We also need to think of it as not just an afterthought in our overall design and policy work for our communities. The public realm is often considered as an afterthought. And so we come to it from a purely aesthetic perspective once all the other planning and design work has been done. Um, and this is, uh, this is unfortunate because the public realm is crucial to achieving healthy communities across Ontario. And as we know, with all the work that we do uh, within OPPI and as professional planners, is that the health and wellness and success of our communities and our citizens is what is of most important to us. The public realm is where civic life flourishes, where society intersects, and where people are encouraged to interact. Think of it this way. It's the stage for which life can, or on, upon which life can perform itself. So if we create those great environments, then people are able to live their lives um, collectively uh, in a way that is, um, there's a benefit to everyone involved. A well-planned public realm can increase pedestrian activity. It can enhance public safety. 
In fact, it even encourages investment and allows citizens to celebrate their places and spaces. So we know that a high quality public realm benefits all the various stakeholders, if you will, that we deal with in terms of our planning work. The public realm that shapes our places and spaces defines our relationships to those. And in doing so, establishes the community identity, the local character, that sense of place. So whenever you hear people using um, uh, sort of popular phrases such as placemaking, primarily they're dealing with the public realm. Some of that does occur within privately owned lands, but the role of those is very different in comparison to things that are fully accessible and owned um, and managed by the public. So why is the public realm important to planners? As professional planners, we're at the forefront of planning for the public realm and the developments which frame them. We need to always remember that we are central to all the activities of our sort of interrelated professional colleagues, be they architects, engineers, or those people that work um, in public health, uh, or folks that are dealing um, uh, with public works, uh, even parks and rec uh, people at various communities that we work for. We are central and bring our knowledge to the table on how to um, bring together all those various influences. And in the public realm is where all of our various uh, interests and ideas and um, professional knowledge come together for the benefit of the citizens we're planning for. So planners must seek out opportunities to enhance the experience and promote investment in the public realm, making sure that it's accessible to all. So as part of that, we need to realize that even those of us that are particularly focused on policy generation, eventually those words are adapted and become, become the, um, the built environment that's out there. So even if you're not particularly involved in um, you know, urban design, if you will, or community design, those policy words, those words that become regulations and process, eventually lead to that environment that others will build. And so we need to be very careful of that. We also need to understand that the shifting policy objectives and competing interests in community building continue to evolve. With social and technological changes, we must encourage people to think about the public realm first and the role it can play in unifying those interests. And that is not only about how people use the spaces, but how they're designed as well. A perfect recent example of that is the um, incredible um, experiences that we saw happening globally in the public realm were technological entertainment changes, such as AR, um, uh, with the, the game Pokemon Go, for example, have recently increased people's interest and exposure to the public realm in a very different way. So we need to understand that as society changes, their experience with the built environment, particularly the public realm, changes as well. And we need to be thinking in those terms at the forefront and not reacting to them if we're doing our job to our best abilities. But now I'm going to transition a little bit into some of the particular elements that make up the public realm. You heard me say before that it can be um, trails, park spaces, plazas, uh, roadways, um, corridors uh, for utilities, playgrounds uh, at schools. All these different things make up the public realm. And so I'm going to begin this section and then I'm going to be turning it over to Eldon to continue on so you have a better understanding of what the different components are of the public realm that, um, that we're dealing with. So first of all, the provision of parkland is fundamental to planning for Ontario's towns and cities. We know this because access to, uh, to nature and having active lifestyles is critically important to the health and wellness of our citizens. And in those places, we need to be providing places for people to gather, play, and socialize. So it's not just the 
physical activity that we're talking about. It's that social interaction and building social capital, as we've seen how important that is for community success and, and uh, wellness. So parks provide a sense of place for neighborhoods. They also help organize and, and create a local fo focal point in the community. So from a design perspective, they have a number of benefits within, um, within a community. As communities continue to intensify, it's changing the way people use parks. And that's beginning to occur in larger cities particularly, but we also see that in smaller and more rural areas as well. People's understanding and expectations of parkland is changing, and that is partially because of the makeup of communities and the change of our culture overall. In the future, not only will the adequate provision of parkland remain important, but so will the provision of parks that respond to the changing needs of an area. So we think of parks in higher density, area, density areas, um, you know, they're relied upon by residents who no longer have access to private backyards. Our built environment and the uh, way that development is changing for us is physically changing the public realm as well. And so we need to be able to respond to that directly from policy all the way down to design. So the public realm in that sense is the outdoor living room, if you will. Places necessary for outdoor exercise, again, to socialize or to experience cultural activities. So we need to think of parkland design being come, becoming more flexible and, again, supporting a range of community activities, incorporating supportive infrastructure for that. Communities also need to reevaluate what forms part of the larger urban open space or public realm system, recognizing that in an area, in an urban area, infrastructure corridors and schoolyards and streets and other public spaces can play an important role. So you can ask yourself, how can you maybe rethink infrastructure corridors or rethink relationships of use for schoolyards and parks within a community? By doing that, we can look at policy and a regulatory environment that perhaps mixes uses and provides opportunities for um, investment associated with parks directly to help offset the costs um, and the management of those spaces. And that's something that's particularly um, kind of unique in terms of our opportunity as planners, that we can influence the design but also directly that interface of other land uses and the programming and functioning of those in relation to the public realm. You'll recall earlier I mentioned that we work at the center of a group of different um, professionals. Again, engineers and architects and landscape architects come to mind foremost. But they don't have the same influence on the land uses and the programming that is necessary for that that we have as planners. So we can provide the policy direction upon which those other folks also will look and, and respond to. Um, but we also have ways of making sure that the regulatory structure and the urban design of that will help achieve those goals. So again, think of this in terms of a holistic approach, in terms of making sure that the public realm supports those kinds of things that we have um, uh, at play and those things that we need, are responsible for in terms of our, um, our role as professional planners. So before I go on to the next item, um, I'm, going to, or I'm going to actually uh, introduce Eldon here and ask him to take over from here. Uh, his role um, at the Community Design uh, Working Group uh, is, is, uh, really, um, uh, is really quite important because those last couple points that I mentioned in terms of design and policy and those things coming together in the built environment you know, it's, it's kind of the last stage of the process of creating uh, a good public realm. Uh, the folks that he has involved as volunteers in OPPI that help that working group move forward and um, provide uh, the insightful work that they do for things like the call to action that we're talking about today um, is, is really critical. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Eldon, and uh, he's going to continue on 
with the, uh, the other examples of what's included in the public realm. Thanks for that, Rob. And um, uh, just, just to build on, on what you're saying there, um, I do want to give uh, a lot of credit to the members of our community design working group. They help to um, bring together a lot of the thinking, the ideas behind the categories that, that we're discussing today. Um, and in no way is it the fulsome list of matters relating to the public realm, uh, but it does focus on some of the key uh, public realm elements and things that we should be thinking about as a profession. Um, inclusiveness and barriers, um, you know, at this critical juncture um, in our community building efforts, um, now more than ever, we need to consider how we are including people um, in the design of our public realm. Factors such as safety, accessibility, even age-friendly design, they all need to be considered in the design and planning of the public realm. So planners need to encourage and provide for public facilities, programs, and spaces that help to foster inclusiveness and appeal to a diverse population within our neighborhoods. Ontario as a whole needs to approach the public realm and public realm planning um, on good policy, planning principles, and data as well that will serve present and future generations. Key to that, and what helps move this forward, um, is um, particularly the AODA standards, which is the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, which helps to provide for barrier-free design and cultural inclusiveness. Public safe planning and design does not reside solely in the realm of planners. We have to acknowledge that. A multidisciplinary approach involving landscape architects, engineers, urban designers, architects, even politicians and members of the public, they all play an important role in ensuring that we are thinking about all and not just a few. A multidisciplinary pro approach um, allows for um, a great sense of input, but planners should provide a leadership role in advancing those interests, and particularly the AODA standards, uh, to allow for the implementation of barrier-free barrier and inclusive design. We should always take into consideration all elements covered by the standards, including sidewalks, in other pedestrian walkways, parking lots, outdoor public use eating areas, even recreational trails and playgrounds. The design of public spaces should also consider the support of new Canadians. As planners, we need to understand the needs of new Canadians and how we can, as a community, accommodate those needs, welcome them, and enhance diversity in the way we build and create our spaces so they are flexible to include all. Moving on to active life and street eco-health. This is about integrating how people move within a community between buildings and neighborhoods and the development design, the development design decisions that create more livable communities. Public spaces should include deliberate design elements that create connections between modes of transportation. From simpler choices such as bike racks and parks and plazas, or more fulsome elements such as public change facilities or even bike share programs at uh, transit stations, well thought amenities within the public realm can help to foster increased mobility options for residents and commuters. These public areas not only become transportation connection points, uh, but also spaces where people can make human connections, resulting in higher levels of social cohesiveness and building of acceptance within the community. Planners have to acknowledge the importance of the pedestrian realm within our streets. Their associated landscapes, and the relationship with the adjacent built form and land uses that surround them. Given the importance of these linear public spaces, we should strive 
through our work to enhance the quality of the public realm and encourage their use to promote active life in our communities. That encouragement can use, could include elements such as trees, flowers, benches, light poles, transit shelters, paving, signage, a whole range of elements within the public realm that enhance the pedestrian experience while moving through a city or a town. And just thinking about the functionality of the space, ensuring elements such as shade and light and places for people to rest and observe people as they walk by were also elements that help to provide that passive um, enjoyment within that important linear public realm. Speaking about reuse and multi-purpose function, we typically know this as adaptively reusing buildings. But when we use the term reuse and multi-purpose function, we're speaking to space. And we're referring to reclaiming underutilized places and spaces and re-energizing or bringing them back to life for community use. Reusing the spaces and creating multifunctional spaces can transform areas into vibrant community spaces and vibrant community places that can potentially play host to a range of year-round activities. By making these actions and choosing to reuse space, you have the ability to stitch together neighborhoods and isolated pockets of activities and create continuous and blended public spaces by filling gaps and connecting missing links within a community. You are re-energizing spaces that can help transform the public realm and offer eyes on the street or enhance safety for underutilized spaces to the public realm, thereby increasing security for residents, visitors, and workers. For example, you think about libraries. They can be transformed into community hubs and support centers for local communities as well as for new Canadians. School gyms and playground facilities on schools can be open to neighborhood residents associations and other sports or cultural organizations for their after-hour use. The reuse and multi-purpose function of spaces should also consider our climatic conditions. We are, we are a warm and a cold nation, and we need to consider all seasons. We need to ensure that the spaces are flexible to accommodate programming all year round. For example, an outdoor trail in the summer can be transformed into an ice skating trail in the winter, ensuring peak activity year round. A great example of that is Gage Park in the city of Brampton. Gaps and underutilized public spaces and places should be identified and inventoried in your municipalities to reclaim these assets for people. Retaining the existing community assets and capitalizing on the existing infrastructure is key to improving the public realm. Community improvement plans can also be used as a tool to reimagine spaces and places and help to provide incentives to attract redevelopment. In speaking about public art, it really is an important piece of, of cultural infrastructure that helps to instill a sense of place and meaning within the community's fabric. It adds a cultural expression to our streets, places, and cities. It can bring people together and allow people to learn about a community's history and significant events or uh, cultural interests. Public art should be cited so that it is accessible and viewed by all. It comes in all shapes and sizes and will be experienced in many different ways by the young and the old. The local context and intent of the art, the local context, excuse me, will always inform the intent of the art and how it's experienced by the user. When public art is designed as a focal point in a public space, it should be something that can be physically experienced, something you could touch, uh, that you can climb on or even sit on. So as well, it should be visually experienced 
in an interesting and effective way. This allows the art to be enjoyed by a wider cross-section of people. Many municipalities have developed specific public art policies or regulations that provide clear directives and, and uh, uh, direction on the acquisition of art through development applications. Other municipalities have included public art policies in their official plans for the acquisition of art through bonusing through the Section 37 of the Planning Act when increased height and density is sought for for development. Uh, both ways are just examples of how you can further public art within your community. Programming as a whole is considering the social infrastructure when you think about the public realm and the needs of the design process that feeds into that. This is about planners needing to think outside of the box in ways in which to energize and rejuvenate your public spaces. The objective of a program is really to create inclusive, comfortable public spaces that foster a sense of community and develop connections among users and to the spaces itself. Traditionally, and when you think back, programming has been perceived as an event planning uh, type of initiative that was delegated to volunteer organizations, perhaps even BIAs, or even professional event firms. However, when you think about it, for public spaces to achieve success as safe, welcoming, and interesting places, municipalities need to start adopting a more holistic perspective towards their long-term and short-term programming. There are four areas that we focused on that can build that can build and help to improve the public realm through programming. Design, policy, tactical urbanism, and planning activities. When speaking about design, we need to design spaces with flexibility, opportunity for users to interact in it, and incorporate opportunities for passive enjoyment within those spaces. This allows people to have a sense of control over their environment and, more, and be more likely to feel comfortable within that space. Examples of this would be trails, incorporating park benches, having public washrooms available, and even incorporating elements such as movable tables and chairs. When we speak to policy, we want to ensure that we provide an efficient and effective policy channel and direction or protocols that make it easy for community organizations and the private sector to plan events and activities within spaces. This can include the provision for things such as grants or the permission for the use of public spaces by the public. Tactical urbanism, on the other hand, encourages people to think, to rethink, excuse me, and use the existing open spaces through cost-effective installations. Retrofitting existing spaces to incorporate elements of surprise and fun in those spaces on a temporary basis can help to energize and provide new life to the public realm. The installations are evaluated on a trial basis. It can often lead to more permanent fixtures of programming. Examples of this can include pavements to plazas, road diets, pop-up patios or pop-up retails, and that's just to name a few. The last is planning activities. Activities should always be planned to encourage the use of the spaces that you plan for. Municipalities should play a leadership role in cultivating cultural shifts within a community. Where local groups such as BIAs and community groups exist, they should be tapped and empowered to take on the programming roles to animate the spaces and places and be supported by municipalities. Those could be festivals, farmers markets, or other types of events that bring people out to enjoy the public realm. So reflecting on the elements that we spoke to and thinking about the long term, planners need to transcend traditional planning tools and look at ways to enhance the social infrastructure of a community. 
This will require collaboration among municipal departments, agencies, and community groups with the objective of optimizing the use of the public realm. And just as a note, all the points that we discussed today, they've all been outlined and detailed in the call to action that was released um, late last year. And I'm going to turn it over to Rob, um, who's going to um, provide some closing points on, uh, on our presentation today. Thanks, Eldon. Um, so you've heard a lot of information on the various components that make up the public realm. And these have been referenced in our call to action, which came out in uh, 2016. And like all our calls to action from OPPI, the intent is that as professional planning practitioners, we use that call to action and let that sort of influence our direction and really build awareness for uh, sort of timely issues. We also need to note that that call to action, as well as all the others that we have, are truly interrelated in the sense that they relate to creating communities that are healthy and successful. And the focus is always on um, the, the benefits to the entire community and that we're working for um, the citizens uh, out there, either in the private or public sector. And so the call to action says that it is incumbent upon us to seek out opportunities to enhance the experience and promote investment in the public realm making sure that it's accessible to all. And OPPI, in fact, with the call to action, challenges those involved in creating and fostering healthy communities to fully integrate the public realm into key aspects of their work. So you'll recall earlier on, and through a number of our um, specific examples, that we referenced the fact that this is something that all planners out there can influence. So those working in the various areas of specialization, um, everything from policy all the way down to design, those that are working in community engagement, those that are working uh, more on environmental issues, in all those various um, specializations and levels of expertise do have influence on the public realm in one way or another. In fact, the call to action relates to all these things that we've talked about today. The changing role of parkland, inclusiveness and barriers, active life and streetscapes, reuse and multi-purpose function of spaces and places, public art and programming. And so I'd like you to think about a few different uh, you know, concepts as we move into the, um, uh, the last few slides of this uh, webinar before we go on to the questions. Think of terms that we've referred to like you know, time and seasonality, all ages accessible and adaptable, contextual, culture, all these different things that relate to the public realm, making sure that it works for those people that are using it now as well as looking towards the future. The public realm, when it's best, is always dealing um, within a time frame of being contemporary but moving forward. So no matter where you're working in, in terms of scale, if we think of urban um, or uh, rural environments or uh, communities and everything in between, we really need to look at what are the needs of our citizens now and moving into the future. We recognize that all communities are constantly changing. No community is stagnant. Sometimes that change is, um, is so noteworthy that it even makes the news, right, that we see these pressures that are, um, that are being sort of uh, felt by communities. At other times, it may be more subtle. But we as planners need to be aware of that because, again, within planning and designing for the public realm, that is where uh, public life plays out, and we need to keep that as a major consideration and know that all the things that we do are interrelated. And so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Loretta before we uh, move on to the, the question portion of this. 
and I'll ask you to start thinking about those questions um, so that uh, we can respond to them uh, as best as we can still during the time of this webinar. Uh, and um, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Loretta. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Now that we have you all excited about the public realm and our call to action, we just wanted to remind you of where the resources are available. On the OPPI website, which is ontarioplanners.ca, if you go to the section on policy, so that's slash policy, you'll find this call to action plus the others that Rob is mentioning. We've had great success in highlighting a number of key planning issues, and I encourage you to check these out. We also have a series of videos, one specifically on the public realm, and this builds on our other videos, complete streets, walkability, active transportation, and others. These are all available through the website or OPPI's YouTube channel. We also have session in a box. That's for our members in the districts. If you liked the webinar today, we do have a version that you can take and modify for your local needs, put in your own pictures, and have a discussion of your own, and we encourage you to use that. And lastly, at our conference last year, we had a design charrette tip sheet created by Eldon and his colleagues, and it's a very useful piece. If you're ever asked to do a design charrette on the public realm, this will be quite helpful. And now we'd like to encourage you to ask some questions. Again, please use the chat function. Any questions we can't get to today, or if you think of something later, please feel free to send it to us, info at ontarioplanners.ca. We are not monitoring this email right now, though, so please use the chat function during the webinar. That email is just for later on. So we look forward to hearing from you, and please bring your questions forward. Well, while we're waiting for folks to get to their, um, you know, to their their keyboards, we're going to go back to some of the questions that we did here. As as Loretta mentioned, that this actually is part of a continuum of work that's been done on the public realm. In fact, it started with the call to action. It then became a presentation at um, uh, at the last time we all uh, gathered in, uh, in in Hamilton. Uh, at the symposium. Uh, it has been adapted for the session in a box, uh, and uh, so and now this webinar. And so some of the things that we've uh, heard um, have come up every time in the discussions, and one of them in particular was the, um, you know, the, the cost of public art and, and that. So I'd like to, uh, maybe we could start with that as some of the other questions come in. Alan, you mentioned that, uh, that session in, uh, or that component in, in the slides you were doing. Uh, what are some of the things that you would suggest in terms of that uh, discussion about cost of public art? Well, I guess there's, there's two aspects of the cost of public art. Um, one of them being, um, you know, how do you, A, get that, um, you know, get that funding to, to achieve that. And the second is, once the public art, art is in there, you know, how do you maintain that? The first part is, is generally, um, it's easier um, through your um, through your development applications. Um, you can require um, one percent contribution towards public art, um, and that simply requires uh, ensuring that you have the policy in your official plan, and um, and working with uh, applicants or developers or groups who are interested in developing on their property um, uh, to source the appropriate art um, under guidelines that have been established by a municipality um, to get um, something interesting uh, that is culturally and um, contextually um, reflective and important uh, for a property. The second part is a little bit trickier, um, which is that long-term maintenance of, of that art. And um, that's typically um, where you want to ensure that your municipal budget, your, your long-term um, budgets for a municipality does include uh, public art elements that are in that public realm as part of that maintenance. The other is reaching out to groups such as um, you know, local community groups or BIAs 
um, or other interest groups that can um, help to raise funds to ensure that those critical art pieces are protected within the community. So I mean, those are two ways that you can ensure to obtain public art and then ensure its longevity through a community. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, one of the first questions that came through now was uh, examples of municipalities have designed large parks, i.e. waterfront parks for continuous usage by large groups, apart from programmed events. Uh, I, I think there's, there's all kinds of examples of that. We see it's, it's easy to point uh, to some of the ones, um, let's say, in a large urban center like Toronto, um, right? You know, there's 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 all kinds of expanses of, of um, waterfront parks. I think the uh, the greater question, the greater challenge, perhaps, is for some smaller communities and look at uh, parks in a different way, mm -hmm. so that it's not, uh, let's say, sort of empty um, kind of bucolic space for much of the time, and then other times when it's programmed. Part of what we're realizing, and much of the themes of what we've talked about, and even in the analysis of developing the call to action, was that the public realm, uh, the, there are pressures on communities to provide high quality public realm because we're um, becoming more intensified. Uh, larger numbers of people requiring better access to good quality public realm. And so maybe we need to uh, rethink that question overall and not think of it just in terms of event space. That's obvious. Uh, but how do we have a public realm that is active more often uh, throughout the day and throughout the season for more people? Uh, you know, in terms of who are the users? There was a second question that came up there in terms of providing um, uh, programming and access uh, for new Canadians. I think we can also even expand that to make sure that you know, it, is, it is for everyone that makes up our communities. We need to recognize that the way uh, um, we have in recent history used our public realm uh, and designed it, in fact, uh, is not something that is uh, sort of common or even appealing to contemporary culture. And that relates to folks that are new Canadians that also relates to age demographics uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, so again, some of these questions, I think we can expand them so that they do relate to those communities that are across the province. Yeah, I saw one of, one of the questions asking, how do you incorporate food you know, into the public realm discussion? And do we have examples? Um, and there are many ways you can do that. I know that there are programs, like for example, um, within the uh, it's a city of Toronto example, but within the hydro corridors, um, there are there are programs in which community gardens are are promoted um, within those local communities to allow for um, planting, and it's actually an educational program, and I believe it's it's connected with the conservation authority, um, and it's a quite a unique program. It's a great way to introduce kids to food. Uh, so. Uh, uh, those are one of the ways. Another example, not local, but you know, abroad, um, there's an example of a, a transit system um, that at every stop um, they planted different types of food where people can pick those items. Um, it's grown by the, it's uh, planted and maintained by uh, those local uh, BIAs, but um, it's available for anyone who happens to stop at that stop to pick that food if they want to. So it's just a way to introduce food into your public realm, into your physical infrastructure, ways in which to remove the food, uh, food deserts within communities, and to encourage healthy eating and, and healthy communities. We've had a question here about are we engaging engineers? We are engaging a host of related professions on all our public policy efforts that would include some of the professions mentioned earlier as well, uh, architects, landscape architects, We've also done a considerable amount of work with public health, and we're very glad to have the ongoing partnership. There's a lot that we can learn from working together, and we don't, as Rob said earlier, have any intention of, of thinking we could solve these problems on our own. And not only that, there are many wonderful opportunities that have presented themselves by working with our colleagues around the table. So yes, we look to engage other professions always. Yeah, and on that point, it's, there was another uh, question there about you know play structures being considered public art, and policies would encourage that. 
again, um, you know, we can kind of take that into a, a bigger question, uh, and it does relate to uh, your comment about working with engineers, and, uh, and uh, someone also had a question on that. We need to recognize that there are certain, um, you know, CSA standards and things of that nature that relate to uh, playgrounds and all that, uh, just like we have you know, AODA and building code and all these other uh, sort of levels of um, policy and or regulation that we need uh, to, to work in. So there are examples where um, public art, uh, and in fact there are uh, pub, uh, artists that specialize in public art that can be played on, um, that they have their own uh, mechanisms, if you will, to be able to deal with those very real uh, challenges that they have in terms of the way their work is interpreted and the safety standards, if you will, that need to be applied in that case. And one thing I'll also like to add is that these are fantastic comments and questions we're getting. And if you have ideas also or examples, um, let's see those because this, while this is a webinar and primarily the information is going from us, us right now out to you, uh, there is value in other people seeing um, uh, you know, seeing your, your comments and ideas. A perfect example also is in, uh, there's a, an urban farm in Hamilton that links at least three or four of the different topics we've just talked about. Uh, the community is involved in that one. It is an organic farm. It includes uh, a, uh, a trail that has been uh, incorporated on there in terms of, uh, you know, the the accessibility component and the recreation component. It also incorporates uh, sort of performance space. And to Eldon's uh, last point in terms of food, in this case it is that it is an edible landscape that's been created that has been specifically designed um, with uh, people from the uh, First Nations community in that area and linking up to one of their uh, trails as well. So there is relating to a, a culture that Go, that looks um, you know, back to our roots, but also by working with the community that's there now, it's looking at the culture that's there now and incorporating that. So again, it is an overlaying of different interests. We just noticed some of you are letting us know how many people are in the room with you. If you have not had a chance to do so already, we would love to know how many people are sitting around the table with you. We understand that people are getting together with their public health colleagues, with people within their community, and we're really thrilled to hear that so many of you are sharing lines. So if you could let us know, that would be great. I noticed that there was a comment about um, uh, community surveys uh, as part of determining the level of satisfaction of a space before and after. And I think that's a really great idea. It's something that could be included as part of the programming of a space. Understanding, having surveys at the beginning to understand the initial need of the community, how they feel about their spaces or spaces that you've identified that perhaps need positive change, um, and then undertaking a satisfaction survey after the fact to measure your level of success or if any further tweaks need to happen. It's an excellent idea, an excellent way to move forward public engagement um, in the improvement of the public realm. There's a great comment there about um, natural spaces and linkages to our urban areas. Uh, I think, you know, in the, in the short uh, amount of space that you had there to identify that, it really doesn't do it justice because that subject unto itself uh, is, is absolutely uh, massive. The public realm that is uh, our, our natural environment, but also integrating that into our more urbanized areas is critical. We recognize, uh, and this is one of those places where our partnerships um, and our colleagues in the public health in, uh, world have been able to do phenomenal research to show that access to nature um, actually uh, has not only benefits uh, across the age spectrum, but from all things from you know, physical benefits, mental health benefits. It has impacts on everything uh, from uh, levels of depression uh, to stress levels. and um, you know, all the various uh, health-related um, conditions that result from those not being in balance. So I think that one in particular is perhaps one of the more broad-ranging uh, 
uh, sort of subcategories, if I can use that term, in terms of the public realm, because it relates to all our communities. The need for access to nature in the public realm is critical, no matter how big or small your town or city may be. Oh, so we got a question about how opportunities are different at lower versus upper tier municipalities. Um, that, that's a good question. I think that in that case, we're really dealing with uh, the scale or the lens with which you are doing planning work. Uh, so things that are um, uh, perhaps more network oriented on, on a small r regional scale uh, in the public realm are greatly influential, uh, particularly how you're dealing with uh, streetscapes yeah. that may be running through a, a village center, uh, you know, that kind of thing. That has a huge impact on, on, on the public realm. It also has an impact in terms of um, a coordination between the upper and lower tier. Um, when you think of your county or regional corridors and how they um, you know, they are the movement of people and goods and, and vehicles, um, but they're also your, you know, your public realm elements that connect uh, the municipalities together. So um, what happens within that space, there's, um, there's an interest on both parties. And I know, having dealt with it many times, there's always different ideas from an upper tier and a lower tier as to what you want to achieve, um, you know, both on private and on public land. And whether those objectives are being met, those, that will always be um, a back and forth, you know, discussion and back and forth uh, negotiation about um, what is the ideal balance to achieving both upper and lower tier objectives. Uh, but it's always good to know that both are starting from the same place, which is we're trying to create um, a positive environment. It's just how you get there. So I always promote open dialogue between upper and lower tier municipalities on what you want to achieve, where it's appropriate to have a certain design or a certain feel um, along, a, along a corridor, and where is it that, that you need something a little more intimate, where you can be a little bit more flexible and a little more open to innovation and uh, looser restrictions on how um, they intersect with local streets or local businesses or local built form. You know, that, that's, that's great because if we think of it uh, and in very broad brush terms, it's, it's easier at the, at the local scale to talk about placemaking, right? Yeah. which is, again, something that people understand to a great deal. Whereas when you're talking at that larger scale, it often, you know, the, the word that comes to mind is utility. Yeah. Right, it's it's that that uh, you know moving of people from here to far away to over there, right? Introducing an LRT within exactly, a that and and, and those those kinds of impacts, I think, what brings it all down uh, and links a lot of the subjects that we've discussed here this afternoon, is if we can always keep in mind the human scale and what it's like for people of all ages, all backgrounds, um, to be in those spaces at all different times of day and all times of the year. So bring it back down to that scale at least during some of your conversations about no matter what the subject matter is. That will always keep you grounded regardless of your role in planning or the role that you have as the organization you're working in. And one of the interesting things that Fred Kent said at our symposium last year was he talked about the combination of big ideas that might require a lot of funding and smaller ideas where you can be innovative at the local level and where you can do things rather quickly. He noted that Bryant Park, for example, one of the first things they did was they brought in small, inexpensive pots of flowers. And that from that, they came up with a whole host of other ideas, but that it was a very successful means of attracting people to come to that space. We're just reading through some of the comments here. Uh, the 1% one for public art, yes, that's been something that, uh, I mean, that goes back a number of years. Uh, I recall when I was working for the city of Vancouver, uh, you know, almost two decades ago, mm -hmm. they had, had instituted that uh, and, and worked quite well. One thing that, you know, that brings up that the public art one in particular uh, highlights the need to get the community involved in this. 
you mentioned the, um, the comments about tactical urbanism as a way of engaging people and testing things out. Well, that process, that needs to be part of a process. It can't just be uh, a stunt, yeah, right? And absolutely. so it's a great way of getting people to, to get engaged in public art. Uh, that definitely gets people interested and, and engaged. Uh, do you have any other sort of comments on that end? Yeah. Um, public art is one of those things where it's very tough because it becomes quite subjective. Where when you look at tactical urbanism, it's easy to get it's easier to get public buy-in because you know there's an there's an outcome um, that is intended to result in the the betterment of that community. Public art can be expressed in so many different ways um, that you could have three people sitting around the table and all three have a different perspective on what um, is the most appropriate uh, form that that public art should take on a property or within the landscape or on a building or, or a structure itself. So it's um, definitely it should be open to um, the public to ensure that they've been involved, um, but the final decision can always be very tricky. And one of the big challenges we've heard from people who have initially had great results improving the public realm is the importance of ongoing funding and programming. And that this is key, and as one planner said to me, there's nothing sadder than cutting a ribbon and something looks wonderful and coming back five years and finding out it's all fallen apart. So that is something where the community and local politicians really come into play to ensure that the great public realms we're creating will be around for generations to come. And, and part of that is, I mean, we recognize it when we talk about uh, intensification of other kinds of land use, the idea of mixed use and properly integrating those and mixing them vertically and horizontally, we need to consider that for the public realm as well. And again, back to one of the very first points we made is that sometimes it's an afterthought and then it becomes an aesthetic exercise. We need to think of what is creating um, the right kind of activity for that kind of public space. So if we understand that a corridor, the expectation is that it will look like the visualization that was created up front with all the pretty people walking around and enjoying the space. Have we really created the platform in terms of land uses and activities and programming to make that a reality? Yeah. Or was it just an exercise in illustration using uh, Photoshop or something like that? So how do we create the right mixed uses in our public realm, if I can kind of merge yeah. those two concepts together. Yeah, and how do we be honest and transparent about how we communicate what the outcome will be? That's excellent. You know, and that, that's a really good note, that we need to be open and honest with the work we're doing, striving to do that uh, the best we can, and working with the citizens to make sure that that's, that's the case. And that creates the dialogue, which creates the right kind of public realm. And that is a great note to end this webinar on. I'd like to thank Rob and Eldon and all of you very much for your time. Please look to future issues of the journal. We'll update you on this key initiative. And again, we encourage you to read the call to action and to put it into action and to check out our resources that are online. Thank you very much, and we'd like to wish all of you a great day. <laughs>